shattered by the sun I walk the road horizons The tournament's begun The purple piper plays his tune The choir softly sings Lullabies in each For the court of the crimson I, I got into music because my brother is a church organist and he um, <clears throat> he instilled a lot of um, what I know now t today to be my musicality into me. I was, without even knowing it, I was being drawn into church music by hearing it in the house all the time. My brother would practice at home. <clears throat> and when I got to a certain age, maybe five or six years old, uh, because there are no bass pedals on the piano at home, uh, my brother would get me to play the bass parts. So I understood to all these hymns and uh, church music. So I understood the relationship between the bass line and the melody line and where they all fell, fell into the chords. I understood chord structures and I was fascinated by the relationship between the bottom line and the top line, which is really what I do in Asia. I, sing the top line and I play the bass line. And uh, well, both together, they fit into the, the chord. I have <clears throat> an ability to be able to see chords in my head. I, I know where each note of the chord is in, them, in my head because of the way that my brother schooled me in, uh, in music. And I, I, I thank him very much for that. He's still an organist and choir master today. And we have very... Um, um, very different experiences of music, even though both of us have continued to be musicians all our lives. Um, when I reached a certain age, again, about 12, when I, 12, I started to branch away from what I'd learned with my brother, and I, um, I started to listen to and to play rock music, which was then started to come into Britain from America. Um, I, uh, I, I latched on to R&B, <clears throat> and although I, I, I liked R&B because of the energy and it was rock and roll, it wasn't really until um, people started adding uh, classical changes to rock music that I started to get really interested because then I would be able to use what I'd learned in church music and apply it to rock music, which is exactly what I did. Um, so when I, um, <clears throat> the first uh, professional band that I joined really was Family. I played in a couple of other groups after leaving college, but the first one that, that, that I joined that, that had done anything uh, recording-wise or uh, concert-wise was Family. And I, um, I joined as the bass player and second vocalist and it gave me an experience of being on the stage in front of people um, with a successful band but I didn't have to take the full amount of the spotlight. I, I learned what it was like to be on the stage and perform live without it, all the pressure being on me. Um, and I, I, I learned a lot with Family. My next step from Family was to join King Crimson where the spotlight was on me because I was an equal writer with um, the other guys in the band, with Bill Bruford and with Robert Fripp. And uh, I was the singer, bass guitarist, and um, so there was a lot more responsibility on me in, in King Crimson than there was in Family, but what I'd learnt from Family was very important to me to get to see me through the King Crimson period. I was very confident and I, I was very good at that point. My um, technique, uh, bass technique was very good. Um, <clears throat> but it, uh, King Crimson was to end prematurely, I thought. I, I, I felt there was a lot more life in the band. Um, but in 1974, no, that was it, it was over. Um, so I, I went through a period where I, I, I worked with other bands 
that I wasn't really a part of. I wasn't a fundamental part of Roxy Music. I wasn't a fundamental part of, of Uriah Heep. And I wasn't a fundamental part of Wishbone Ash. But they, I always believed in, in a very strong work ethic that I keep working. And uh, no matter what, I keep working. So um, going through the, the motions with these bands, um, were just, it was just a stepping stone to get to the next project, which would, would, would be um, more, feature more of a, a musical involvement from me. So if you take King Crimson as really the first step in that direction, where I was a fully fledged member of a band, where I was a singer and a, a contributing writer to the material of the band. The next one after that was UK. And um, I'd, been, I'd been on a world tour in about 1975 with Roxy Music. And um, we, we, were play, we played in Japan, we played in Australia, we played in North America. And every time I would do an interview with a journalist or a radio person, they would say the same thing. Well, you know, Roxy Music's okay, but, uh, you know, when are you going to do something real? Um, like King Crimson, you know. And I had to, well, okay. Uh, so I remember I wrote to Bill Bruford from Australia, and I said to him, uh, there's, a, there's still a lot of demand. Everyone that I go to, to do an interview, they're asking me about King Crimson, and <clears throat> when are we going to do something like that again? And uh, so when I got back from that tour, um, we set about forming UK. He brought in his favourite musician, and I brought in a musician that I'd been working with in Roxy Music, which was Eddie Jobson. Bill Bruford had been working with Alan Holdsworth, and we put the four of us together. There was UK. Um, UK did in its own way in 1977, 78, 78, um, <clears throat> did in its own way what Crimson had done in, for me in 73, 74. Uh, but again, the, there was a difficulty with the personalities involved in the band, and that only, it only really lasted for two years. In 1979, we came to a halt. I had been, at that point, I'd been talking to uh, John Kolodna at Geffen Records. Um, he was still at Atlantic Records then. <clears throat> and he had been looking to me to form a band that they could really get their teeth into that would sell a lot of records. And um, when, I f when I formed UK, he said, mm, yeah, nearly, nearly, but not quite, not quite. <clears throat> and so I'd kept my contact with John Kolodner. And in 1980, I did a solo album called Caught in the Crossfire, which was looking toward the new decade to the 80s. And it was much shorter song orientated compositions with a lot of vocal, um, a lot of emphasis on the vocal. And he said, yeah, this is the direction. And now you just need the vehicle, the band. And in 1981, I was introduced to Steve Howe and we started work on some basic song structures, some ideas. And we were looking around for um, people to form a band. We didn't know what it was called then, but we just had an idea that uh, that we could form a musical entity. And there were a lot of ideas about people who would be able to work with us. And gradually, over a period of a few months, um, Carl came into the fold, Carl Palmer. And because of the management connection and the fact that Jeff had been in, in Yes, he was suggestive as, a, as another member. Um, I liked the idea that Jeff would bring another, another um, facet to the group, which is the keyboard depth that he was able to get, the different sounds and the textures that he would bring. We didn't know at that point, until we sat down at the piano together, that our, our writing styles would be identical very, very compatible. So when that happened, 
that everything was there. All of the ingredients for a group were there, and all we had to do then was to make a record. Uh, I had enough songs started that when we put them together with Steve and with, with Jeff, the, the songs just came very, very quickly. Um, we, we then found our producer, Mike Stone, who was the last guy to come in to see us. Uh, <clears throat> we uh, we um, auditioned uh, about nine or ten producers, and none of them seemed to have the, the right idea about what we're looking for in terms of sound. Um, we, we had a very strong idea of, of what sound we wanted for the album, which was we wanted to be big, quite bombastic, lots of vocal, um, lots of layers of, of uh, guitars, keyboards, big fat drum sound, big vocal sound. The last guy that walked through the door was Mike Stone. He had just finished work with Queen, Journey, and uh, <clears throat> he was just exactly right for this band, absolutely right. Personality and his technical expertise were exactly right. So everything fell into place at the right time, and in 1981 we recorded the first Asia record, and that, that really is, is where it started. After that, lots of things happened, but... Um, to, to go through what happened in the last 25 years would take forever. So all, uh, all it needs for me to say really is that what started in 1981 is now being carried on by the same four people in 2007, and here we are. Yeah, it's great, it's great. I'd forgotten, I think all of us had forgotten how good the band sounded 25 years ago with that, with the chemistry of those four people. We've had it in different versions since then, lots of different permutations of those four people, but never the same four people that started it. So, yeah, it's great. And it, it, it works. You know, the chemistry is there. It, 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 it was successful in 1982 for a very good reason. And it, the reason is that it's those four people. And you, you take any one of those out, it doesn't work. The song, I think, that has a particular meaning to me is not what everyone would think, which would be Heat of the Moment. It's not at all. The most significant song that we play, in, for me, in the set tonight would be Ride Easy, because <clears throat> I didn't know at the time. Uh, the, the first album, there's a lot of... Uh, a lot of um, there's a lot of emotional stuff covered on the first album, usually about uh, a sense of loss. About any time will tell is is some is is losing someone quite dear. Um, <clears throat> Heat of the moment is an apology. I never meant to be so bad to you, and uh, a lot of it is about emotional loss. And I didn't know it at the time, but. I was actually writing about what was happening to me at the time. And uh, the words to Ride Easy are particularly poignant to me, and they, uh, the, it comes across to the audience as well. But it, it's, it's, um, <clears throat> it's particularly significant to the four people on stage. It means a lot to me because um, it describes exactly how I was feeling at the time when Asia was born, and uh, it was—it just seemed like one long party. One every night turned into the next night, and it was just one long party. And uh, it's not like that now. It's not a party anymore. It, we actually enjoy what we're doing, but it's great to revisit that and to remind myself of what it was like then. Um, <clears throat> Bright Easy was never on an album, was never on an Asia record. It was on a record, it was on the B-side of, of Heat of the Moment. But it was on, uh, it was, um, it was used at the time as a, as a commercial tool. That is, it was put onto the cassette, because the record company were getting too many bootlegs of, of cassettes, because cassettes were very easy to bootleg at the time. 
<clears throat> it was before CDs came in, and they wanted to to give the cassette a chance to sell. They put a bonus track on the cassette, which was not on the album, in the hope that a lot of people would buy the cassette rather than just tape it. <clears throat> and it worked. But Ride Easy was that song. Ride Easy was the Ride Easy was the bonus song that was never on an Asia record on an album. Um, and so it's nice. I think to be able to give that to the audience and say this is for you because it means a lot to us, and it's a song that you'll never find on on a on a vinyl album anyway. Bye.